Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us in another NETEX COVID-19 webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about renal replacement therapy during COVID-19. Just as a reminder, during the webinar, on the bottom bar of your screen, you should see a Q&A option. If you have questions you'd like to ask, please ask them there. Our panelists will be able to answer them in real time, and then if we have time at the end of this webinar, we will answer those questions as well. So please make sure you're using the Q&A um, button at the bottom. My name is Amanda Grindle. I'm a faculty member um, for NETEC, who's located in Atlanta, Georgia, and I will be moderating this webinar today. So welcome and thank you for joining us. So just so you guys get a good bit of the agenda today, we will have um, several sections. The first section, once I'm done with this welcome, will be managing dialysis through a pandemic, and we'll hear from Dr. Nina Kaplan and Dr. Manish Tandon. Next, we'll have nursing considerations for managing a surge of COVID-19 patients requiring dialysis. And you'll hear from some of my nursing colleagues, Penny Dennis, Andrea Faulkner, and Trish Tennell. Then that will be concluded with a section on acute renal replacement therapy for critically ill patients in the ICU setting during a respiratory pandemic. That will be given by Dr. Michael Connor. And then I will come back on and give you some uh, resources for NETEC, and then if we have any Q&A time left over. Each of the speakers today will be introducing themselves uh, before their section starts. So for those of you who aren't familiar with NETEC, we are the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, or for short, NETEC. We were created in 2015 through emergency supplemental funds appropriated to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services specifically to the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We are a collaboration between Emory University, Nebraska Medicine, and New York Health and Hospital Bellevue, with a mission to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens, particularly like COVID-19, which is what we will be discussing today. We do have a website, so please visit us at www.netech.org. And you can also find several um, things on that website. NETEC has four areas of work. We have consultations through online assessments and consultations. We have education through in-person learnings and online offerings. And we have online resources and virtual assistance with technical assistance on our website at www.netech.org. And lastly, we have a research infrastructure and network that spans across all 10 regional Ebola and other special pathogen treatment centers. This also includes a um, biorepository uh, there as well. So we're gonna get started with today's webinar by first talking about managing dialysis through a pandemic. I'm gonna hand over it now for Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Tandon. Hi, this is Nina Kaplan, um, a physician at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. And this is Manish Tandon, um, one of the surgeons working with uh, Dr. Kaplan um, on the uh, renal replacement therapy response. So uh, first, we just want to put this in context of uh, renal replacement therapy in austere environments. Uh, Yuan and all had uh, described three different scenarios for uh, potential uh, problems with being able to provide adequate renal replacement therapy. The most common ones are typically scenario one or two in, uh, some, in an area which has an earthquake where they either have dialysis capabilities or very limited dialysis capabilities, and, uh, but they then become damaged um, and have a large number of patients who need dialysis. We were actually um, uh, much more comparable to scenario three where they describe uh, an area where there's adequate dialysis capabilities normally, um, there isn't extensive damage to them, but then there's a large amount of influx. And they actually describe that one of the scenarios would be uh, a um, infectious outbreak, um, which then set off a large number of patients with AKI requiring renal replacement therapy. So this is uh, the Bellevue experience um, for that scenario three. And I just wanna say that um, as we've talked to other centers throughout New York, which have all dealt with this, they've each had to deal with it in their own unique ways based upon their own capabilities and strengths and limitations. And um, so we're giving the Bellevue experience as one example of how we approached it and some of the lessons learned through there. 
Um, again, uh, we uh, normally have adequate dialysis capabilities for our patient population. We did have some disruption of supplies um, and had limited supply chains uh, um, because of the, everybody needing a significant increase in supplies. We weren't able to increase that. The disruption of supplies was uh, related to um, uh, so it's, um, some equipment problems and then also the staffing that as the staff got sick, that had a significant effect on being able to provide renal replacement therapy we normally would. Um, the adapt and communicate uh, model is, uh, is actually quite critical in that uh, oftentimes we, as we were encountering problems, we would come up with a solution, we pursue that solution only to find another obstacle and then have to work around and trying to find another solution. So the key is that as you encounter problems, is just keep trying to adapt um, to solve the problems. And communication is really uh, important because uh, especially renal replacement therapy is an area which is under the auspices of a large number of folks. Renal um, obviously uh, runs the overall show, but uh, there's one area which is um, responsible for equipment, another area responsible for supplies, um, another area um, looking at some of the patients and thinking about um, prioritization. We've got uh, staffing in another area under nursing, and so it does require a lot of communication across the spectrum. Um, okay, so phase one of the pandemic was when we first started to see an ups uptick of patient admissions. Um, at that point, we had enough uh, CVH machines and standard hemodialysis machines to um, adequately care for those patients. However, as more and more patients um, became, were admitted and with the severity of illness, and it became apparent that we were not going to be able to adequately um, handle the influx of patients. Number one was um, our chronic uh, inpatient dialysis unit had to be closed due to infectious disease concerns. So that's a majority of our usable dialysis machines. So we at Bellevue Hospital had five uh, portable machines left to handle all of the patients, ESRD patients that were admitted to the hospital and for other AKI patients that needed um, hemodialysis. Uh, additionally, we had six CVH machines available in the ICU, so those were designated to, if, when the pandemic started, we were using the portable dialysis machines for patients on the floor, not in the ICU, and the CVVH machines were used for the hospitalized ICU patients. However, um, we ran into problems with uh, supplies. Yeah, so um, I said, you know, one of the biggest obstacles was that ability to track what we had, um, who we had to run it, um, what equipment was working and not working. Um, as I said, you know, each area was under very different um, um, responsibilities. So we had our central stores, which would be ordering um, a lot of the fluid we had, um, our critical care office, which would order the filters we had, uh, the CVH machines under Biomed uh, without any one central space that they would be kept. So you never knew if um, all six machines were working or not working um, or how many were um, sometimes being utilized. And then you, um, and then the number of nursing staff uh, was changing um, as we'll go through the other phases, uh, was changing rapidly. And so how many staff did we actually have to run um, both the hemodialysis, which would be the dialysis nurses, or the CVVH, which would be the ICU nurses. And so um, we start at this time to work to centralize the information as much as possible. And it's something which we continue to work on through the rest of the phase. It, was, it wasn't an immediate solution. But we um, start to move um, any equipment to central locations. All the dialysis-related fluids, filters, et cetera, all got moved to central areas. So it was actually much easier to keep an eye, to simply go into the room and visualize how much equipment we had in, in each area. We were, uh, we were eventually able to move to where somebody was recording it out each day in terms of, of all the critical equipment, what we had, and um, extensive work with uh, nursing to know uh, what we had in terms of capabilities, um, of nursing capabilities to be able to run 
um, the different types of dialysis. So in phase two, um, we know that, that patient volumes are rapidly increasing and our ICU nurses are becoming um, extremely short staffed. So as I said, the CVH is typically run by the ICU nurses, but we went from our normal model where we have two to one <coughs> nursing in the ICU and then we have a different uh, nurse who runs the CRT machines on one or two patients um, or a one-to-one -one where the nurse takes care of the patient and the CRT. Uh, but we, uh, as our volumes rapidly increased, we actually had a three to one and at one point um, a four to one ratio on some patients in the ICU, which meant that there was no capability to actually be able to run uh, C CRT. The other was that we were finding with COVID um, and the hypercoagulability, our CVH filters were frequently clotting. And so our supplies uh, start to, we start to run for supplies much faster than we expected. Um, at this point, we were still um, thinking that we'll be able to manage this through our normal processes, which would be intermittent dialysis on the floors and CVH in the um, room. Um, you'll notice the picture on the bottom right shows that a CVH machine is actually outside of the patient room. And that was for two reasons. One is that our total PPE was limited and so we were trying to minimize how often people were going in and out of the room. And as any of you who run um, CVH know, it does require um, at least one hour um, interventions, if not more frequent. Um, and so one of the uh, ICU nurses was able to find a way to um, bring the CVH machine right outside the room along with our, along with our IV pumps. And that way we could um, keep the door closed maintain uh, precautions and be able to do the interventions more frequently without having to utilize a large amount of PPE. Um, at this time, even though we were seeing clotting, we were still using our standard anticoagulation, citrate or systemic anticoagulation, and we even tried a combination of both to try and improve filter life. Um, again, we continued to look to see what we could do to make our standard processes work. Um, as I said, make the CRTs easier to access, and then um, because our nursing shortage was, at that time, our biggest limitation, uh, we uh, were looking at what we could do in terms of who else could run our CRT. Uh, we actually started to train um, non-standard uh, well, we, non uh, professionals to run it. In this case, uh, we had a, a large number of uh, about 10 nursing practitioners coming from our outpatient arena in to help in the ICUs. So uh, we ran them through one or two day courses on running this uh, CRT. Uh, we did find, however, that it was more complicated than they were feeling comfortable with. Oftentimes, they were still having to get a lot of help from the ICU nurses, and um, it wasn't that successful. As I said, you know, you keep trying different things to see what you can, what, how you can solve the problems and keep looking for the solutions. So, um, as I said, our dialysis needs kept increasing. We weren't able to provide a full renal replacement therapy. And at this point, we really had a daily meeting, um, both in the morning and evening, uh, between the IC staff, nursing, and um, uh, renal uh, nephrology to uh, determine which patients uh, need to be prioritized, uh, which was really that if they had severe metabolic derangements, um, that was who had to get dialysis most acutely. If somebody had um, hyperkalemia, which wasn't amenable to medical management, again, that was a uh, person who got it um, uh, first, um, we um, shifted to underdialyzing. Um, additionally, on the four patients for hemodialysis, we had to resort to uh, dialyzing about two times a week, sometimes decreased time, duration of dialysis treatments, and then would follow the electrolytes to see if they needed, patients need, would need extra treatment. But this was done because there was such a shortage, and we ha actually had no alternative, and we wanted to get everybody dialyzed at least an adequate amount. So issues of, uh, sometimes there were questions about the amount of uremia we were seeing and did they need dialysis for that level of uremia. However, you have to remember that all these patients were heavily sedated and you really actually couldn't tell if there was any symptomatic uremia or not. Um, so although uremia was a marker that the patient was gonna eventually require dialysis, that in of itself was never an absolute indicator. Um, as I said, when we talk about under dialysis, um, as Dr. Kaplan said, one thing was to, um, instead of running the intermittent hemodialysis for four hours, it would be run for two or three hours. 
and instead of the standard three days a week, it would be done to two days a week. And what that allowed us to do was, um, because we had a limited number of dialysis nurses, uh, several of them had gone sick, uh, we weren't able to recruit additional dialysis nurses because every single center had a large volume of dialysis needs. Uh, with those limited number of dialysis nurses, we were able to get them to cycle through multiple patients, more patients in the day. And on the CVH side, um, normally when you put somebody on continuous renal replacement therapy, you leave them on it um, potentially for several days as long as the filter is lasting or until you no longer require it. In this case, we actually uh, shifted to where we were giving a limited amount of uh, CRT on each patient. So 10 to 12 hours for one patient, move the, pa move the, fil um, the machine over to another patient, use it on that one. And so although we only had six machines, we were trying to utilize it for uh, 12 patients per day. Uh, but that did uh, result in a significant increase in uh, filter um, use uh, by doing that. However, and in addition, the amount of clotting that we were seeing these filters was also substantially increasing the filter use. Um, so when we were initially thinking about this in March, about what was gonna happen, we um, planned it to use traditional uh, modalities that we have, uh, HD and CVH primarily. Um, then we were thinking if we were not able to use that and had no other modality, we would have to go resort to the fourth arm. So we um, decided uh, sometime beginning of March to try to initiate the third arm, which is initiating a PD program at Bellevue Hospital, which we currently, we had not had any experience with acute PD, and we had very few patients on chronic PD. Um, occasionally one would be admitted from an outpatient, but we were not really familiar with widespread use of PD at Bellevue Hospital. Um, but we were trying to do anything to avoid having to not offer people any renal replacement therapy at all, which would, would have been the other alternative. And that rationing of care, right, which is that fourth arm, was something which we had to talk about uh, from um, the beginning was, um, are we gonna get to a point where uh, we would have to think about rationing care? Um, so there were discussions about that, but the goal was to try not to get that uh, possible. So um, as, we, um, as things continued, the number of patients in the ICU were rapidly increasing the number of patients going to renal failure and requiring dialysis were rapidly increasing. And we were at a point where we could not provide full renal replacement therapy um, using our standard approaches. At that point, uh, we started um, the peritoneal dialysis program. Uh, there were several obstacles to that. Um, one was getting a buy-in from the ICU physicians, which even at this point in time um, continues to be an issue in that there isn't a lot of experience uh, from critical care physicians in using peritoneal dialysis for acute kidney injury, um, as there is in other parts of the world. However, in this case, we had a simple uh, issue, uh, uh, solution of necessity. The only way we were going to provide renal replacement therapy to some of these patients was by doing PD. So that was an easy way to get by in at that time. Education and personnel. So Dr. Kaplan um, had created a peritoneal dialysis booklet, which necessarily covered all the roles and responsibilities and um, really described nicely uh, what each person would be doing related to PD from the patients, from the people putting in the catheters to managing the peritoneal dialysis. And we were able to train a group of non-traditional providers to manage the peritoneal dialysis. Well, our options were really to think about trying to educate all the nurses um, quickly in peritoneal dialysis versus a very focused group. And uh, with the um, short staffing we had in the nurses, we really thought that educating everybody broadly was not a good solution at that point in time. So uh, we took some um, um, MDs, uh, PAs, NPs from other areas, including ophthalmology, dermatology, um, who um, weren't able to um, practice at this time. We brought them in and taught them how to manage the peritoneal dialysis. The placement, we had choices between IR, interventional nephrology, and surgery um, because of the number of patients requiring it and um, the high infectious risk by moving them and the high amount of uh, support that required on the ventilator, it was best placed at the bedside. And, and we had a group of surgeons whose elective practices had been halted and um, were therefore readily available. Um, so uh, we recruited surgeons for placement. 
and supplies, uh, we were able to identify a supplier for both connectors and fluid. That was actually a little bit a harder uh, issue than we expected, but um, that was uh, solved. Also, just to give um, people a sense of what of how many patients we had uh, to do dialysis on. So typically Bellevue has uh, ICU with 54 beds. At our peak with all our extra ICU um, uh, outposts that we had, and then we had two patients in each room, we had about 120 ICU patients at our maximum, and about 40% 40 of, of those required some form of RRT. So it far um, exceeded our capacity. Uh, so this is what you can see here is that as we start the peritoneal DOS program, uh, we had um, CRT filters running out. The interesting thing here is that um, in our, we had a supplier for um, the CRT filters, but because they were getting so much demand from across the nation and other parts of the world, they actually they essentially said that the most they can supply us is 100, 110% of our normal needs. And we were well beyond two times of our normal uh, requirements. So, um, and in addition, the filters were clotting at much faster rates. So that wasn't gonna be adequate. Um, we identified contraindications for safe placement of peritoneal dialysis, but any patient who did not have this contraindication uh, immediately, um, as quickly as possible, got peritoneal dialysis catheters placed. We, at our peak, were placing uh, six or seven a day, um, and we placed a total of about uh, 42 or 43 peritoneal dialysis catheters so far. And then uh, the other things we were doing was we were cohorting dialysis patients on the med surge units so that one nurse could run two dialysis machines and we were constantly trying to recruit dialysis nurses and other um, additional nurses um, in the ICU to be able to um, assist um, with the management. So at our uh, peak, uh, we actually got a large influx of nurses thanks to the military and um, other agencies. Um, our staffing improved to going back to two to one staff in the ICU. We had the ability to run all of our CVH machines. Uh, we got our next ship of the filters and that, um, and our needs for the filters had decreased because of our peritoneal dialysis. So uh, we were able to not only supply ourselves with the CVH, but when, when our sister hospitals had run short for one week, we actually had enough supply to help them out also. Our peritoneal dialysis um, uh, functioned well. Um, and uh, soon we were able to obtain cyclers, which allowed us to improve the level of dialysis we were getting so it could be run 24-7. Uh, um, as you can see, this chart has a lot of words, but basically these are just some of the um, obstacles that we face uh, with HD, CRT, and PD. As we mentioned, PD, we actually had very little experience for. We had no nursing staff uh, that were up to date on training for it. Um, we our physicians, while familiar with PD, um, didn't know actually how to usually as physicians order the PD, we didn't actually uh, know how to use the cyclers either. Um, and as, as you can see um, on disposable equipment, we actually at some point ran down to about four CRT, CVVH filters to last for the next three or four days for the whole ICU. So we were really out of equipment at some points. Um, but uh, as you can see also the PD Sim, uh, the training curve on learning PD was much easier than teaching uh, people how to do CVVH or hemodialysis. Um, for uh, peritoneal dialysis, first we planned, we didn't realize we would have so many patients on PD. Uh, we, our initial plan just included CAPD, which is manual exchanges. But once we had these patients um, in the ICU, we realized how hypercatabolic they were, and we were trying to get adequate dialysis for them. So we were doing very frequent exchanges, um, which was very labor intensive. At certain points, we had about 25 people on the PD team, I would say, to um, run the PD 24 seven with very frequent exchanges which was working, but again, very labor intensive. So then we, we about a week and a half into this, we uh, started using cyclers, um, which we uh, had uh, training from one of the local nurses and watched some YouTubes. And 
we trained the whole team how to use the cyclers as well. Um, and this allowed us to do more high, higher volumes and uh, run 24 seven uh, with less uh, intensive uh, person power needed. And so that's the constant adaptation uh, which we keep talking about. Um, as I mentioned before, with this cycler, we were able to increase uh, the volume of uh, dialysis and uh, we monitored adequacy uh, even before we even started using cyclers with um, traditional methods with uh, based on acidosis, phosphorus level, BUN creatinine, uh, volume status, and all the patients uh, seem to be adequately dialyzed. And at no point, once somebody was on PD, did we have to ever supplement with CVVH or intermittent hemodialysis based on any of our parameters. Yeah. Based on the uh, vast majority of patients for the PD working well, there were two or three where uh, we had technical issues, um, but everybody else where it was working well, it, once, they, once we had a working peritoneal dialysis, um, which, and all these patients were starting with peritoneal dialysis, within an hour of the catheter being placed. Um, our leak rate was a fairly small, infection rate was uh, zero, and um, uh, um, again, even in prone patients, we were, it, once uh, we realized that we had to make sure we had easy access to the uh, catheters when they are prone, we were able to continue peritoneal dialysis even in prone patients. Um, just our statistics, as of May 8th, we had 63 patients evaluated, 38 catheters were placed. Um, out of the 35 patients that remain, 20, 20 um, passed away, um, eight had recovered, and seven remained on PD. And as I said, once we were running so low on um, supplies, people defaulted the everybody defaulted to PD as a method for renal replacement therapy, unless there was an absolute contraindication. Uh, summary, PD, we felt had equivalent outcomes of mortality. Um, we had high rates of mortality for all, all mod modalities. Um, that at first, before we even started on this, there were a lot of concerns about ability to adequately ventilate patients on peritoneal dialysis. We never, um, we tried to use lower volumes. Our highest volume was about two, two liter dwell, and this never seemed, never had any impact on ventilation. And um, as I mentioned before, we were able to provide good control of electrolyte and fluid removal, and we didn't ever have to not dialyze somebody or not, not provide uh, CRT based on ability to provide it. And the bottom line is it allowed us to increase the amount of dialysis provided um, and didn't, we were not, did not have to make any difficult choices of not providing it because we were out of supplies or personnel. And so there's ongoing issues with uh, education, um, the education ICU staff, as we were thinking about who to utilize PD versus other modalities. Now we have the ability to provide all modalities, uh, minimizing any complications, uh, continue to utilize it when it's prone and uh, shifting to where the nurses staff will take over. Uh, we're continuing to um, assess our outcomes and monitoring for our other issues such as protein loss and nutrition. And we're working to improve our process, laparoscopic placement, timing placement, as well as just well, making sure that LTACs and other facilities can manage the PD. And so now we'll turn it over to uh, uh, Penny Dennis, Andrea Faulkner, and Trish Tanil. Hi guys, my name is Trish Tennell and I'm the Associate Director of Nursing. I'm also our Nurse Lead for Special Pathogens and Trainer and Critical Care Nurse. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some background about what had happened. So I want to talk a little bit about dialysis. So I want to tell you that only our ICU staff, and that includes our ICU staff and our CV PACU, are trained to do CRT, bedside dialysis. So when this started, we as Dr. Tandon and Dr. Kaplan said, we only have six machines for CRRT, and one of them was out of commission. Um, we got that one fixed very quickly. So the patients needing the CRRT exceeded the number of machines that were available. Now remember, at this time, we hadn't any, had any supplementary staff. So our staffing at this point was a four to one ratio, and we had patients on multiple, multiple drips. Between two patients, you may have 
10 to 12 pumps going. So that's just a little bit of background. But I'd like to turn this over to my colleagues, Andrea and Penny, to give you a little bit about the Nebraska background. So at Nebraska Medicine, our experience was a bit different than what they saw at Bellevue. We had a just very slow trickle of patients coming in that were positive for COVID. Initially, we started with one COVID unit here um, and our nurses, surprisingly, would have to go to that unit frequently. About, out of all the patients that were in-house uh, with COVID over March and April, uh, we provided dialysis to about 20 to 25% of those patients. So we still saw the influx, um, but I, our preparation was a bit different. Um, we have a, a, a comprehensive uh, acute dialysis department um, that's staffed with about 20 nurses, um, and they're versed in all modalities of dialysis. So we do hemodialysis in our treatment room and at the bedside. Um, we do, do peritoneal dialysis, and then we also do CRRT using the next stage machine. Um, and we also contract with a couple other hospitals in the Omaha area and provide dialysis there as well. Um, so even though we didn't see the same influx that they experienced elsewhere, um, we were able to focus on being prepared because we felt the upswing would be coming or um, if it wasn't for patients in the Omaha area, we'd be patients in surrounding areas that were coming to Nebraska Medicine. Thank you, Andrea. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our constant assessment and reassessment of our resources. So remember what I told you, our staffing ratio was a four to one ratio. So when we started to have this big influx of patients that were going to need CRT or other forms of dialysis, which again, we also outsource our hemodialysis, um, we hit our nurse educators, our nursing staff that used to be ICU that were CRRT trained that went to other departments like case management, we pulled them all back into the ICU to help run these machines. Um, when it came to our peritoneal dialysis, we had nurse leaders who had done home care with peritoneal dialysis that had worked in ambulatory care, one of our directors of nursing there. So she was pulled back to help us with this. Um, we also collaborated with our renal and our critical care teams. They are the ones who developed the criteria on which patient would be dial dialyzed and for how long. So it was a great, great, great team effort. I just can't even say that enough. So um, seeing this need increase, we did have to closely monitor what equipment we had on hand and look at other resources. And one of the things that we are is a sister hospital to our corporation. Um, we have a lot of institutions that do the same thing, and we were able to get some equipment when we were try starting to have our shortage that helped us go on. So as it relates to just on the fly planning and execution that we had to do to provide nursing care at, at Nebraska Medicine, um, a lot of it was monitoring our PPE and supplies. Um, the organization went to universal masking to where the staff had to wear a mask all the time, including patients. Um, but there was, this was closely monitored um, by our supply chains to make sure that we had everything that we needed. Um, in dialysis, um, we wear lots of disposable gowns and went through those frequently prior, um, but we came upon a shortage and are still experiencing a shortage now that it's, it's really tough to um, get adequate PPE um, for what we do in dialysis. So it's really just been being creative um, wearing the isolation gowns that they wear on the floors that are uh, reusable is something that we've went to in the department. Um, we've also been keeping in close contact with the vendors and monitoring what we have on hand, what's needed. Um, Next Stage, who supplies our CRT machines and equipment, um, have actually been calling us weekly uh, to get a hand on exactly how many patients we have, how many we have on CRT, what are our needs, are we able to, to keep up with the demand. Uh, so those relationships with our vendors have been very uh, helpful um, in maintaining the, the supplies here, making sure we have what we need. Uh, there's also been a dashboard in EPIC that was created um, by our uh, EPIC, our electronic medical record team here, that actually shows real time daily um, just the use of PPE throughout the organizations, masks, gowns, gloves. So just I felt it was important to keep a watch on that daily and then update the staff as needed. Um, there was lots of education and reinforcement done with the staff. As you guys have probably all experienced, um, things changed almost daily, especially when we were in the initial uh, uptick of this pandemic and trying to um, 
give give staff the the right information as things were changing all the time and just really encouraging that resilience with them that you know hey things are not going to be set in stone and they will continue to change so we have to be up, uh, adaptable in that um daily updates with staff um been sending out uh, daily uh, email if we're not able to do our, our huddle actually together then still giving the staff real-time updates of uh, how many COVID patients we have in-house um, just what our staffing needs are so forth and so on also time was spent to create resources to um, kind of pull all of the different information together as it related to universal ma universal masking the the proper processes of dying doffing um, all the all the information that was coming out it it could have been information overload. So kind of trying to uh, take the high points of the information and putting those resources all in one place, but also making sure that I'm keeping my ear to the streets, essentially in the organization to make sure that I'm in tune with what's going on day to day as things are changing. Therefore, I could make sure the staff had the most up-to-date information that they needed to, to do their jobs and feel safe in that respect. One day I'm gonna learn how to mute myself. One of the key points, and I know Manish um, talked a little bit about this earlier, was the fact that we were able to put our CRRT machine outside the room door. Now the way we did this was an extension tubing. It was that we moved the door, the bed closer to the door, so we would be able to ex extend that tubing. The nurse would have access to the CRRT machine. So all our rooms are negative pressure. Um, I know that I have the door open, but I wanted to get this picture for you guys. Sometimes you aren't able to do that, to rush the tubing through, but we were lucky. We have those rubber gaskets on the door, so we were able to close our door, still get that seal, and the tubing didn't crush. There's a picture of our cycler. Now, this was great. I loved our PD team. Um, we did our cycler. That also was outside the room. They would be able to extend the tubing. Now, since we outsourced our hemodialysis, our hemodialysis still was done at the bedside. That required some just-in-time training that we did to our hemodialysis nurses who are contracted out. They were really great, but, and they also spent more time outside of the room. We tried to limit the number of times they would go into the room. Um, we borrowed linen and fluid warmers from our OR, so we would make sure that all our nice PD fluid was nice and toasty where it should be. And again, the hem I would just reinforce the fact that most of the hemodialysis they saved was done on the floor. So the hemodialysis was done, was done upstairs. But one of the things that you don't know, but I, I will explain to you now, is we sort of had to play musical patients. So not only would we try to cluster them as many times as we went into the room, put machines outside the room, we also tried to cluster our patients needing um, CRRT or hemodialysis because not all rooms on the floor are made for hemodialysis. So that way you could have one nurse taking care of two machines. And that really helped us during the staffing shortage. So innovative nursing care delivery strategies here at Nebraska Medicine, again, were a bit different. Um, as I said earlier, our nurses were going in and out of the COVID units frequently because lots of these patients had dialysis needs, um, whether they were on continuous renal replacement therapy or they were actually doing hemodialysis at the bedside. So one thing that we did here was to uh, assist the nurses with the starting and discontinuing of the treatment in the COVID unit. So we would send an additional staff member to help the nurse actually get into the, get the machines into the room um, and then just kind of be there to help them don their PPE, make sure that all their bases are covered. Then when it was time for the treatment to be over, we also sent another staff to go help the nurse bring the machine and, and all the equipment out of the room. Um, and then double clean the machine, make sure that there was that four minute dry time with bleach. Um, and so the nurses reported feeling a little more just safe and supported to have an additional person there um, to help them clean equipment, just to help them doff to make sure that they were following the steps appropriately. Um, we did see an influx of patients requiring CRRT. Um, Penny will kind of talk to you about what we did there. Hi, my name's Penny and I'm one of two nephrology nurse coordinators. And here at the Nebraska Medicine, we have three set of nephrology physicians, private nephrology, academic nephrology, and kidney transplant nephrology. And as our next stage machines were uh, being maxed out, I communicated with our lead nurse and then with all three physician groups, communications key that we 
what could we do? Who can go on CRT for 10 hours and be off for 10 and move that machine elsewhere? It was a constant communication, constantly pulling the physician groups in, and they worked very well together to assess what patients would be able to get off the machines. Um, we didn't have any issues with PD, nor did we have any issues with our HD machines, but uh, the communication is key. Absolutely. Um, and then also going back to just the cleaning of the machines and the equipment, we actually went to all disposable items for our HD machines. Um, we have um, an acid loop. So traditionally we would fill jugs with acid and that is how we would dialyze the patients on bedsides. Well, we decided to also get acid jugs that were disposable, the one-time use. Um, that way there was no waste left over. Um, since again, trying to figure out and, and it's still kind of up in the air of um, how well do our cleaning techniques actually uh, disinfect our machines? Um, is it adequate? And so we felt like the safest thing to do was to um, only take what's needed in the room, um, but also make all of the items on the HD machine disposable. Um, that way reuse of anything was, was extremely low. Hi, so I just want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening now and what we did throughout. So, you know, people really needed to be supported throughout this process. And you may think of these excess teams or these extra teams in HD because they really are an outsourced part of Bellevue. They need to be supported too. So we have a strong support system with our Helping Healers Heal program and our rest and recharges rooms. That really helps people. They're also available to do one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, I will tell you that our peak of number of patients to be dialyzed was just last week. So things are still going. People still need dialysis. We're still doing a lot. And you know what? I don't think things have sunk in yet. I think that we're still so caught up and now we're switching over from, you know, a mostly COVID facility to uh, that we're taking patients that are non-COVID. I don't think people have had time to sit and reflect on what they've done and what has happened over the um, last couple months. Um, at Nebraska Medicine, addressing the psychosocial needs um, of the nurses has been um, a priority for myself and, and the leadership team. Uh, the reality is the stress is still high in Omaha. We're still seeing an uptick. Um, our inpatient admissions with COVID have tripled in the last two weeks. So just even that, the fact that we're just kind of still in the middle of the country and now just seeing this swing, people are still a little uneasy. Um, the daily discussions with the nurses um, ha have been helpful. They have questions every day. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I get the answer for them. We still celebrated Nurses Week despite the circumstances. Um, and it just allowed us to just come together still and just have appreciation for one another and just what we do. Just trying to continue to boost the morale despite the, the gravity of, of the situation. Um, and also encouraging them to take time away has been something that I've been continuing to encourage them to do. Um, so if they're able, if we're, we're done early a day, um, as opposed to telling you know, tell them, hey, work on education or make sure you get your hours. It's been, hey, take the day off, finish, finish at home. Um, no need to, to worry about staying. We've also been tracking the nurses and who's caring for COVID patients. That way we're not having one or two nurses um, going into those rooms frequently and, and caring for multiple patients. We're trying to spread it out and keep things even. All right, so I'm just gonna say this really quick. You guys gotta have communication and teamwork. And when you have that, you're gonna have camaraderie among everybody providing care. Um, it was just amazing. And I hope you guys learn from experience. And uh, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Uh, same thing here in Nebraska Medicine. We noticed uh, just with the close communication with multiple provider teams um, and then amongst the nurses is just the strengthening of relationships um, and that improvement in communication, everybody being willing to step up and do what's needed to be done to take care of patients. Um, and I think that that's something that's encouraged us because we all know we're in it together. No one is alone. Um, and also getting and staying out of the silo. Um, being, being more informed, there's information coming out all the time and just encouraging the teams to talk to one another and just stay abreast of what's going on. Just my last thought that I wanna give you guys 
is that please make sure you don't get behind in documentation. Um, in our higher, in the height of our search, things weren't getting documented, not getting documented, nothing replaces good documentation. Make sure people are trained. Don't take ingenuity for granted. These people came up with great ideas. And remember that everybody's always afraid that this can be overcome. Key takeaways from the nursing perspective at Nebraska Medicine are support, support, support is something that um, as the nurse manager of, of the department, um, being available to them, being present, um, giving them lunch breaks, going up to their bedsides and so that they can have a lunch, um, putting myself in, in the line of fire, to, uh, for lack of better words, just to show that I'm, I'm there working side by side with them. Um, I would come in on my off days and check on them, make sure that everything was going well and communicating open and honestly with them. I feel like they appreciate that um, and, and still do and just keeping the lines of communication open. And again, if I don't have an answer to their question, I'll let them know that I will find an answer and keeping my word on that. All right, so you guys can all see it. So what do I want to do in the future? I want to increase our educational capabilities for CRT. I want to take advantage of our staffing now so we can get our core staff educated. I want our supply chain tightened up, as we mentioned before. And I want to debrief as a team to get the best practices down on paper and documented. Our key takeaways here, we're adding our staffing contingency plan uh, to policy. Um, that way going forward, we are prepared when some things like this happen. Uh, continuing to partner with our outpatient dialysis units and keeping the lines of communication open. When we have to discharge these patients, how do we get them back into the community? Um, and then just re maintaining the relationships and also doing like we're doing here and sharing what we've learned because I feel like everybody has something that they've gained from the situation and, and all that we've been through over the past couple months. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Michael Connor. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been fascinating listening to um, all of the experience out of New York and, and, um, and Nebraska. So thank you all for sharing all of this. Um, I will try to go through um, my slides and, and hopefully finish uh, maybe just a couple of minutes past the hour, but hopefully people can stick with us if need be. Um, so just uh, by introduction, I am a nephrology and intensivist uh, here at Emory. Um, I have oversight over our CRT and ICU-based dialysis programs across five hospitals uh, uh, in our hospital system. We have a total of around 50 CRT devices uh, shared between our various hospitals, and um, we um, um, have so far um, had about 270 COVID confirmed positive patients in our intensive care units across um, our system. So let me see if I have um, some control here of this. Um, so, um, so, um, so obviously anytime we're in a respiratory pandemic and we have a high burden of severe respiratory disease, that's gonna come with things like mechanical ventilation, fluid overload, shock, and nephrotoxins, all of which lead to AKI. In general, in the ICU situations, in, in before COVID and in general ICUs, historically about 12 to 15% of all ICU patients require dialysis. But if you look purely at respiratory failure in ARDS cases, that's a much higher percentage. And so on the basis of that, we uh, put we came together very early before we even had any patients on our system uh, in the um, beginning of March and started um, discussing that we needed to have a system-wide plan for how to uh, manage this. We realized that in all situations, acute renal replacement therapy in the ICUs is a team sport. Uh, it involves um, every member of the team that's taking care of patients um, and that we needed system-wide expertise to operationalize and implement uh, any sort of service plan and this included both our nephrology and intensivist physicians, our advanced practice providers in the ICU, our uh, nursing and other staff in the ICU, our educators, uh, our pharmacists, our supply chain management, um, and across the board. Um, we also recognize that in a surge situation, members of the team, much as has been described uh, by, the, by our, our the colleagues uh, earlier on in this, there's going to be a lot of physical, emotional, and moral stress uh, uh, of the care teams that are taking care of these patients and that they'll need additional support and resources. And that addition of dialysis to a patient in, in this uh, 
stressful environment would further introduce uh, difficult challenges for the patients and the staff. Um, provision of dialysis, as we said, impacts everybody, not only the planning situation, but the actual provision of dialysis for that patient uh, has a wide uh, impact. And that we needed to have protocols and policies in place that would minimize the risk to the patients, to the staff, and to the wider hospital community um, overall. So we also recognize that early reports out of um, out of uh, other resource uh, rich environments like Western Europe and Italy, as well as early reports out of Washington State during this uh, during their uh, initial outbreak were that a higher frequency of patients were requiring dialysis up to 20 to 30 percent of patients. Um, and um, that we also fully expected both AKI and ESRD patients in our ICUs. And so anytime there's a surge in ICU census, there's gonna be a surge in ICU needs, but dialysis is obviously a finite resource as everyone has discussed. And so we really took the approach that we needed to have a clear surge plan in place. When we went into that surge plan, we realized that we have no strong data that really clearly demonstrates that one method of dialysis is superior to another uh, for acute renal replacement therapy. We all have the ways that we do it at our individual center. So at our healthcare center, almost all dialysis in the ICU is provided by continuous uh, CRT machines. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right or superior uh, method. Um, we also wanted uh, to take the approach that as long as we had uh, sufficient equipment to provide dialysis, uh, every form of dialysis, if done correctly, is effective and should be able to achieve the patient-centered goals. And as long as we had the appropriate amount of supplies, we could balance the type of dialysis that we were providing and we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be uh, limited with any ethical implications of this. So our design in, in our center, our goal was to provide, use multiple methods of dialysis to maximize the number of patients who could receive appropriate dialysis and to equitably distribute and utilize all the resources to provide the benefit to the most patients. Um, but there are obviously challenges that came with that that have been outlined so well before. Um, and so when we looked at this, we said that while we didn't necessarily provide all these forms of dialysis, the, the, the pantheon of dialysis options in the ICU include true CRT. We use the PrismaFlex machines, and our workforce for that would be our ICU dialysis needs, um, that are our ICU uh, um, nurses. Then there's also using shift-based CRT, where we use CRT for 10 or 12-hour sessions using the PrismaFlex machines to provide um, uh, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy options. Then there is uh, more traditional, what's called PERT or SLED that uses a conventional dialysis machine. Um, and our workforce could be dialysis nurses or ICU nurses uh, or some collaborative model. Uh, then we have traditional intermittent hemodialysis, and then we have acute peritoneal dialysis as well. Um, and so we said, how do we balance all of these in order to design a program that works for us uh, to, to use all the resources we have available to us and build our teams around that? But it's also important to realize that the surge plan always starts at the local hospital or health system level. What do you guys normally do at your facility and which modes uh, are preferred? And then inventory of your available machines and understand your supply chains, uh, not only with machines and solutions, but also dialysis related medications such as citrate, calcium, anticoagulation, and other sorts of stuff. We do propose and would really suggest that after this COVID-19 is done, that we need to probably develop regional and national coordination um, with regards to this. There needs to be sort of rapid real-time understanding in an ICU surge situation, what is the evolving renal placement therapy needs so that we can effectively coordinate uh, supply chains um, to match supplies with demands. So if you think about it, it's not exactly very easy to move some of this stuff around the country. So for example, CRT machine or CRT fluids come in five liter bags. That means they weigh five kilograms. There are two bags in a case, generally speaking, so that's 10 kilograms per case. Uh, most patients use between 
um, use between 40, uh, 40, 45, up to 70 liters of solution a day. Um, and so if you're going to move 10,000 cases of solution to, say, New York City, that's going to weigh 200, 000, uh, 220,000 pounds, and it's not exactly something you can just do overnight. So there needs to be some regionalization uh, with regards to that. So at Emory, we took the plan that said our normal operations is CRT. Um, we could machine load balance for plan B, where we move machines between institutions to, uh, to balance our need uh, and everything else. Plan C was to mix the durations of CRT, so we would have some patients getting 24 hours, some patients getting shift-based CRT. Plan D was to introduce uh, CRT, uh, um, uh, SLED, and intermittent hemodialysis in more frequency. And then plan E was to add PD uh, in conjunction with our surgeons uh, placing PD catheters. So uh, what would determine where we were on this was really based on how many patients we had and how far we got down our plan. And that when you look at this, if we're walking in the uh, plan A, we don't really have any real new risks to the, to the system and our supply chains are intact. But as we move down the system, we have challenges with some supply chain issues as well as challenges with um, uh, potential risk of errors as people are doing procedures uh, that they're not as familiar with. And so these were sort of our contingency plans, and that was more of our crisis plan mode. Other things that we learned along the way was that you have to really continue to reassess how things are going. What are your successes, your challenges, your failures of renal replacement therapy along the way? Uh, and uh, reevaluate how things are going. So one of the things that we very quickly learned was that we're having lots of circuit failures and thrombosis, and we come up with some different attempts. The first time we noticed that our vascular access was not appropriate length in a lot of patients, and so we published and distributed a, um, uh, guidelines for how to select uh, appropriate catheter lengths. Um, and where we wanted our preferred catheters. That didn't really fix the issue, and so then we decided to come up with a tiered anticoagulation plan where our patients would, uh, would move from one plan to the other based on how their circuit performance was performing. And so this is why it's important to evaluate all of this overall. So in summary, the number of patients requiring dialysis is going to increase whenever you have an ICU surge. Renal replacement therapy is a finite resource. I think what you've learned from everybody uh, is that all the hospitals that have presented here today have far fewer dialysis machines at the hospital compared to the number of ventilators that they have. Uh, not that every patient on a ventilator needs dialysis, but if you have 180 ventilators and you expect 40% of patients to be on dialysis, you're going to need more than your six or 10 CRT machines. The hospitals should really be encouraged to develop and frequently update renal replacement therapy surge plans, and you need to monitor your machine and system performance and adjust dialysis protocols uh, rapidly. So thank you, and I'll hand it back to Amanda. Thank you so much, Dr. Connor, and all the other speakers that we had today. Really great information. Really quick, I just want to close up with some of the resources that we offer through NETEC. Please remember that we are here to help. Um, we have lots of resources related to dialysis and many other things related to COVID-19. If you have other questions that you would like answered, please feel free to email us at info at and we will get those directed to the right subject matter expert. And again, if you would like some type of technical assistance for us to look at your policies or plans or just uh, more in-depth questions, you can find that on our website as well. Today, the Q&As that we had will be published with our webinar today. Most of those were answered live in the Q&A box by our speakers. Um, and those that were not able to be answered today, we will get those published for you with the webinar. And again, we are on social media. If you would like to join us to get updates on outbreaks, new courses, and available resources, please follow us. We do have skill videos that are posted on YouTube. Uh, we are getting close to having our own channel, so please subscribe to those videos. And again, if you have questions about anything today or anything related to emerging special pathogens, please feel free to reach out to us. And this concludes our webinar today. Please uh, feel free to check us out online and don't forget to stay tuned once this exits for your um, evaluation. Thank you much, so much for joining us today. Have a great afternoon.